the sound of cannons brought me back to reality as that beautiful midsummer day turned to despair. The first soldiers to reach our home were their advance guard. Talitha, our faithful servant, came calling, Yanks! Yanks! What you're hearing is actor LaDonna Pacer playing a historical character, Mary Ann Harris Gay. Gay was a writer, poet, and supporter of the Confederacy. She survived the Battle of Atlanta and the aftermath. She also owned at least five people. You can visit the Mary Gay House, even rent it for a wedding or event. You can learn about her life and struggles. You can hear about what a hero she was to the Confederate States of America, how she refused to leave her home even as it was occupied by the enemy. That enemy would be soldiers of the United States of America. You will have a much harder time finding out about the people she owned. Today's podcast is not about Mary Gay. It's not even really about the actors who portray historical figures like Gay. Today's episode is about how difficult it is to talk about slavery, how we usually get it wrong, and why it's so important that we keep on trying. was scattered everywhere. The only position left unscathed was our piano. And we knew that it only awaited. There's a joke I tell. I've told it in every interview you'll hear on this episode. It goes like this. It's easier to pull a tooth from a rabid crocodile than it is to get people in the United States to talk about slavery. I admit it's not the best joke, but it is accurate. Slavery is not just an issue in U.S. history. It's the thing that made U.S. history possible. Seriously, Edmund Morgan describes how, in American Slavery, American Freedom, slavery made it possible to fight the British, to win, to build wealth, and to be the United States. We have freedom because we had slavery. That is one hell of a burden. Anyone willing to talk about it should be commended. The people in this episode talk about it, so I thank them for spending some time with me on this project. LaDonna Pacer has been an actor for the last eight years. She's acted in movies as well as produced. She plays Mary Ann Harris Gay in a play she's written and produced based off Gay's autobiography. She's married to Bill Pacer, a veteran actor himself. About 13 years ago, Bill was hired by a festival to portray Benjamin Franklin as a walkabout character. He's been portraying Franklin ever since. I spoke to the Pacers because I originally wanted to talk with them about Anacrocon. Bill is a director of the history track. At the time of the interview, I didn't realize the Pacers were also actors and portrayed historical figures. We ended up spending most of our time talking about what it's like to portray Gay and Franklin. Specifically, talking about the relationship between the characters they portray and slavery. So how do you describe yourself? Are you an actor or a reenactor or a cosplayer or something else? An actor. Everybody knows about what Benjamin Franklin did, but very few people know what happened on the home front while he was gone, what his wife did in his absence. And I fill in that gap. So what's the difference between an actor and a reenactor? Well, a reenactor just reenacts certain events, not becoming the person. But an actor becomes that person and talks about the person's life, and they talk about it from that person's perspective. They actually become that person. And one of the things we always do for our shows, we have a talk back after, afterward. So people can ask us questions about Ben Franklin or Mary Harris Gay or, or whatever character we're portraying. They, so they can ask us questions, and we answer it either two ways. We can decide whether to answer it as our actors portraying these characters or as the character themselves. Bill is also clear on what it means, at least for him, to be a historian. Historians are people doing history, not necessarily those with a degree. This is totally fair. Being a historian is not like being a lawyer. You don't need to pass an exam or even have gone to school. You just have to study. You also have to be able to make an argument. And one argument is why what you're studying deserves to be studied. Why should we study Mary Ann Harris Gay? Most people don't know to the extent of what she did. And I want to change that. I can give you an example. The uh, Northern soldiers used her mother's home for their headquarters. And she learned what was going on with both the Union and the Confederate armies. She found some information that she thought 
um, was important enough that she needed to get them to a Confederate officer. And so she got permission to go and visit the sick relative. Um, and she had um, an escort from the Union soldiers. And she took those newspapers and sewed them to the inside of her petticoat and walked um, to with the escort to the home of her relative. And when he departed and left her with her relative, she walked another 14 or 15 miles from there to Atlanta and found a Confederate soldier, an uh, officer, and gave him the papers. Nobody knows that she did this. And this was not the only thing that she did. It's one of many things that she did to contribute to the war. Nobody knows. There's definitely complication in Gay's life. There's a lot to unpack. But still the question is, so what? Why should we spend our time examining the life of this person? What is it going to show us? Bill had a thought on this. When I talk about war, I think about the soldiers, the troops, and, and the big battles. And don't realize about the little things people do mm-hmm. in order to, to fight, fight the, 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 the conflict in their own way. Mm-hmm. You know, the, like the French Resistance, people have heard about them, but they don't really know that much about the individual people in that. Same thing. She was the part of the Atlanta Resistance, if you want to say it that way. This does answer the question of why we should study this person, but it raises another. Do I want to describe Gay's effort to help the Confederacy as, quote, the Atlanta resistance, unquote? Resistance to what? Also, saying Atlanta makes it sound like the city was unified. Was it? There were Atlantans who were fine with U.S. troops in the city. There was a shantytown called Shermantown in what is now the Sweet Auburn neighborhood. I've been beating around the bush here, so I'll just come clean. A lot of doing history is putting events and actions into context. If we're talking about the Civil War South and its aftermath, we have to remember that the context is slavery. One group of people was deriving benefit because another group of people was considered property and not human. The historical analysis has got to put that front and center. Historian Kalinda Lee makes the point. It's funny when we talk about Southerners a lot of times now, people will say, you know, well, Southerners have a very conservative view of history, or Southerners were, of course, Confederates. And I'm thinking, well, four and a half million black people were Southerners. Um, Not so sure that that's true for them. Dr. Lee is the historian at the Atlanta History Center, a wonderful museum that, as the name suggests, focuses on the history of Atlanta. The 36-acre site has a working farm people can wander through. The Smith family farm is modeled on a small enterprise where a white family worked the land with less than 10 African Americans held in slavery. The History Center also employs actors. Some play the family who owned the farm, and some play enslaved people forced to work there. This is a difficult endeavor, and for a lot of reasons, including the lack of direct accounts of those enslaved. Dr. Lee explains. There's a reason why... Uh, people do a lot of kind of lifestyles of the rich and famous history. And one of the reasons that there's a lot of lifestyles of the rich and famous history is because rich people had a lot of stuff, and rich people tend to have good quality stuff that gets saved. Um, And so when you're in an archive or you're in a museum, you will find a lot of that. It's a harder thing to locate what we call the material culture or the stuff of people who have very little of it anyway, um, who were regarded as it, right? Because that's what chattel is. It means you were owned like livestock. You were stuff. And the things that they had tended to be um, of lesser quality and monetary value. So they were not things that were saved or that survived. The history done at museums or by the Pacers is known as public history. This is historical interpretation done for those who don't identify as scholars, i.e. the public. Public history is still vigorous. It is still about making an argument based on evidence. Lee is a trained historian, so she goes right to the what-if question. Why do we need to study the realities of slavery? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start to answer the question of the challenges of doing public history about slavery um, by sharing with you something that a friend of mine um, said to me in South Africa. So she said to me that in their truth and reconciliation process, One of the things that was central to them is doing history so that they will always remember what happened and use those lessons. 
But she said, I've done a lot of work in the United States and visited the U.S. a lot. And one of the things that really concerns me is that I think you do history to give yourselves permission to forget. And what she meant by that is that we create certain narratives that leave out painful, difficult, challenging subjects. And when you do that over and over and over again, you create a new narrative. You create a new past, right? You create a story of the past that just eliminates these things that were central in shaping the nation or the region or the person. Um, And we do a lot of that with slavery. What does it mean to forget? And what exactly are we forgetting? Well, one thing we've forgotten is how to talk about slavery. In my conversation with the Pacers, I talked a little bit about the Smith family farm at the Atlanta History Center. I told them my crocodile joke and asked them about Gay and her relationship to slavery. Here's their response. Marion Harris Gay had a good relationship with her, with her slaves. She, she did. And, of course, some people will find that repulsive because they're still slaves. And she makes some apologies for that. Um, but the same token, she makes it clear that okay, there are no men left in the house. All the men are gone. It's just a mother and Marion Harris Gay. So therefore, the relationship they had with their slaves was different. They, they became more friends. To her, to Marion Harris Gay, Toby and Talitha were family. Yes, to Mary Gay, they were family. Toluth and King were two of the people owned by Gay. Did they think they were family? I asked Lee about this. In her autobiography, it would not surprise me for her to state or maybe even believe that these people who she was holding against their will and forcing into unpaid labor would love her. That assumes, I think, Um, some kind of naturalized state of childishness or innocence or ignorance or malevolence or something that makes them unlike other people who all want to exercise free will. Um, So so there's already in this this sense of something other, something less than equal, less than peer, less than human about these people. Lee can't understand how someone can come to the conclusion that everyone got along. The majority of people enslaved did not live, work, and die on a large plantation. Most enslaved people were forced to work on small farms and worked alongside the people who owned them. This was the case for the gay family. However, Lee calls it simplistic to assume that just because people worked together, they were family. Even at our institution, there is a lack of information that um, propels some people to oversimplify this experience. The fact that people worked collaboratively in slaveholding and enslaved experience um, makes people much too quick to jump to the conclusion that they were like family or that this was a fine arrangement. Um, That is not something that we have evidence of or that we are trying to promote. Why is it important to Gay that people know that her and the people she enslaved were family? She made sure to put it in her autobiography. There's even a section where years later, She meets one of the people she used to own and makes a point of going and shaking her hand. Why would Gay care? The fact is, people knew slavery was wrong, even while they were doing it. The fact also is, people struggled with it. They struggled to accept that what they were doing was horrible. If you attended school in the United States, you may have just had a reaction to what I just said. That reaction may be something along the lines of, you're putting a 21st century viewpoint on 19th century people. That is exactly what I was told in high school whenever students started condemning slavery. Frankly, I don't buy it, and neither does Lee. Here, she explains. You know, dating at least as far back as the writing of the Bible, like we have documentary evidence that people understood that there were problems with enslaving people, right? This is not a new notion. This is not a 20th century notion. Let's not treat our ancestors as if they were somehow amoral, ridiculous beings that didn't have a notion that this could be problematic. In fact, they write lots and lots and lots of books and pamphlets and give speeches and do all kinds of things to try to justify this behavior because they know that it's problematic. To be fair, Bill Pacer did walk his comment back in the conversation. And the point of this is not to condemn Bill or LaDonna or anyone else who's doing this kind of work. My point is that this is a difficult conversation to have. What makes it more difficult is that as a society, 
We don't want to have the difficult conversation. The Atlanta History Center is a multi-million dollar entity with decades of museum experience. Dr. Lee is a highly educated and experienced professional historian. Yet she fully admits that the institution has work to do to get the story of slavery right for their visitors. The conversation about slavery is not something the country as a whole is willing to have. That makes this a difficult project, to say the least. Imagine now trying to enter this conversation all by yourself. All of this is a good reason to just avoid talking about slavery and its impact. Yet we can't. To do so is to give ourselves permission to forget. We have an obligation to remember. And besides, forgetting is not even possible. The ideology built by slavery isn't gone. Again, Dr. Lee. But I think that another part of the reason that this is so difficult and so important is because as dominant cultures, Americans had to create a philosophy, ideology, to make this okay. And that ideology didn't just die the day that people were emancipated. So these stories, this fallacy, this mythology of racial difference that justified how it is that you can take people and place them in bondage and force them to work and do all of these things was predicated on this notion that blackness had to make people inferior. Blackness had to make people less than human. Bill and LaDonna Pacer are doing good work. They are bringing some little-known history to the public. Are they getting some things wrong? Well, of course they are. That is a problem, but it is a mistake to let that shut down the conversation. The greatest error one can make is to not say anything. Here is Dr. Lee once more. About a month ago, I attended a conference and was um, fortunate enough to hear a speaker talking about um, the idea of slavery as the nation's original sin. And one of the things that he said was that um, he disagreed with the notion that slavery was the nation's original sin. We can almost hear the gasp in the room. And then what he said is, the nation's original sin is all of the ideology and policy that was put in place to support that system. Because that is the legacy with which we continue to live. And that is the legacy that continues to burden us. And so dealing with this history and this heritage is not something that we should view as a continued burden. Dealing with it is the way that we liberate ourselves. The speaker Dr. Lee is referring to is Brian Stevenson, an Alabama-based lawyer and the founder of the Equal Justice Initiative. He spoke at the American Alliance of Museums. I don't have a recording of that talk, but he has spoken on this topic before. In 2014, Stevenson gave a TED Talk called We Need to Talk About an Injustice. Here is a short excerpt from that speech. Well, I talk a lot about these issues. I talk about uh, a race and this question of whether we deserve to kill. And it's interesting, when I teach my students about African-American history, I tell them about slavery, I tell them about uh, terrorism, the era that began at the end of Reconstruction that went on to World War II. We don't really know very much about it, but for African-Americans in this country, that was an era defined by terror. In many communities, people had to worry about being lynched. They had to worry about being bombed. It was the threat of terror that shaped their lives. And these older people come up to me now, and they say, Mr. Stevenson, you give talks, you make speeches, you tell people to stop saying we're dealing with terrorism for the first time in our nation's history after 9-11. They tell me to say, you know, tell them that we grew up with that. And that era of terrorism, of course, was followed by segregation, decades of racial subordination and apartheid. And yet we have in this country this dynamic where we really don't like to talk about our problems. We don't like to talk about our history. And because of that, we really haven't understood what it's meant to do the things we've done historically. And we're constantly running into each other. We're constantly creating tensions and conflicts. We have a hard time talking about race. And I believe it's because we are unwilling to commit ourselves to a process of truth and reconciliation. In South Africa, People understood that we couldn't overcome apartheid without a commitment to truth and reconciliation. In Rwanda, even after the genocide, there was this commitment. But in this country, we haven't done that. I was giving this lecture in, in Germany, some lectures in Germany about the death penalty. It was fascinating because one of the uh, scholars stood up after the presentation and said, well, you know, it's deeply troubling to hear what you're talking about. 
I said, well, we don't have the death penalty in Germany. And of course, we can never have the death penalty in Germany. And the room got very quiet, and this woman said, uh, there's no way with our history we can ever engage in the systematic killing of human beings. It would be unconscionable for us to, in an intentional, deliberate way, set about executing people. And I thought about that. What would it feel like to be living in a world where the nation state of Germany was executing people, especially if they were disproportionately Jewish? I couldn't bear it. It would be unconscionable. And yet in this country, in the states of the Old South, we execute people. We are 11 times more likely to get the death penalty if the victim is white than if the victim is black, 22 times more likely to get it if the defendant is black and the victim is white. In the very states where there are buried in the ground the bodies of people who were lynched, and yet there is this disconnect. Well, I believe that our identity is at risk. That when we actually don't care about these difficult things, the positive and wonderful things are nonetheless implicated. We love innovation. We love technology. We love creativity. We love entertainment. But ultimately, those realities are shadowed by suffering, abuse, degradation, marginalization. And for me, it becomes necessary to integrate the two. Because ultimately, we are talking about a need to be more hopeful, more committed, more dedicated to the basic challenges of living in a complex world. For me, that means spending time thinking and talking about the poor, the disadvantaged, those who will never get to TED, but thinking about them in a way that is integrated in our own lives. In an interview with TED, Stevenson gave an update to his speech, where he talked about a new project in Alabama. Here's a short piece from that interview. Well, we started a new project on race and poverty, and I've been very uh, excited about it. We want to change the way we talk about race in this country. Uh, there's a legacy of racial inequality in America, racial injustice that we've never really confronted. Uh, slavery is an issue that we've never really talked about. There were myths created about people of color during slavery. The Emancipation Proclamation didn't do anything to deal with those myths. The 13th Amendment doesn't end those myths. And because of that, in many places, slavery didn't end, it just evolved. And then we had this era of terrorism and violence where we did horrible things. And so we're trying to counter that by putting up slavery markers. You come to Montgomery, there are 59 monuments to the Confederacy and to the Civil War, and not a single word about slavery. And so in December, we put up four markers talking about the slave trade. We're going to lynching sites across this country, and we want to put monuments and memorials at lynching sites to force this country to reflect more honestly on that legacy of violence. And we want to change even the narrative around civil rights. It's the 50th anniversary of a lot of these events, and you get this narrative now looking at TV that, you know, one day Rosa Parks didn't give up her seat, the next day Dr. King led a march on Washington, the third day Congress passed some laws, and, and it's just this wonderful transformation. And we haven't talked about what decades of trauma and humiliation and subordination did to people of color and to people who are white, some of whom were taught that they're better than other people because of their skin color, and we haven't helped them recover from that abuse and that lie. As we have to change the narrative around these issues. John Brown's knapsack is strapped. Links to Stevenson's speeches will be in the show notes. I encourage you to listen to the full version. If you have a chance, stop by the Atlanta History Center. Tour the Smith family farm. See a little bit about how folks lived those who enslaved others, and those who were enslaved. Finally, make it a point to see Bill and LaDonna Pacer perform. They are regulars at Anacrocon, but you can find them all over town. Thanks for listening. You can find more information about this podcast at alternativehistorian.com. I also tweet at Daniel Altist. Take a moment to rate this on iTunes. It helps people find the podcast. 
Change Over Time is part of Amplify, an oral history podcast network bringing podcasting to the field of oral history. Safe travels. Above in heaven now are looking kindly down. The stars above in heaven now are looking kindly down on the soul.